This morning, the message is ticking all the boxes. And how many boxes are there? Well, some sources say 613 boxes. You're like, oh man, that's a lot of work. That's, that's what the rabbis figure. If you look at that Deuteronomy 7 passage when God says, if you keep all my commands, if you start from Genesis 1 and you get to that point in Deuteronomy 7, there's 613 different instructions that Jewish people have to follow. I know I couldn't do it because you're not allowed to have a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you have to keep two different refrigerators in a truly kosher house, one for dairy and then one for meat. I just put that out there as an example because it would be very, very difficult to get the praise that um, Zechariah and Elizabeth get at the start of Luke 1 to say they walked, they were righteous in God's sight and they were blameless in the keeping of those commandments. But let's go back and say what was the promise of those commandments? In Deuteronomy 7, it says, if you keep all these things, basically, a summation, if you were to put this into, well, I can't say a tweet anymore, but I haven't learned how to conjugate X. You know that we don't tweet, right? It's now X. So if you X, which I guess you could say if you X all the boxes. But anyhow, in our modern jargon, if you were to shrink it down to a minimum number of characters, God says, if you keep all my commandments, you basically, and this is the tweet, nothing bad ever happens to you. Isn't that kind of what people, at least people outside the church say, if you, if you just obey God or, you know, put God first, nothing bad ever happens to you. Oh, come on now. Some of you must have surely heard people who think that that's why Christians become Christians in the first place. Right? Fire insurance, trying to avoid bad things happening to them. I call it Christian witchcraft a lot of times if we get hung up on the rules. You know, should, is this the right translation of the Bible to read? Maybe God will be mad at me if I, you know, read a, a chapter or two from the Living Bible. Oh, man, you guys are hard work this morning. <laughs> But the promise that goes with that is, you know, you're going to, your numbers are going to increase, your, your young, your, your, your children's program, your back to school program is going to thrive because it's never going to lack for students. Your herds, they're always going to, you're not going to have any calves that are bo stillborn or any lambs that are stillborn. Your Wheat, grain, they're all going to, they're not going to have any worms, any caterpillars, anything like that. Nothing bad is going to be, you're just going to go from victory to victory. This is the promise of Deuteronomy 7. So you have to imagine that Eleazar and, or I'm sorry, Zechariah and Elizabeth, as they're walking this walk with God, where God says, you know, in his holy word, they were... They obeyed all the commandments. They were righteous in God's sight, blameless in the commandments. They had to wonder, what are we doing wrong? Because either Deuteronomy 7 is true or we're messing up. Now we're old. Their 36th birthday had come and gone many times. I don't know if you know this yet about Glenda. We're coming up again on her 36th birthday. We only ever celebrate her 36th birthday. About three weeks from now, we're going to celebrate her 36th birthday again. Her 36th birthday is old enough to go drinking. Let's just say that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it says they were full of days, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And they thought, you know, if the magic's going to happen, well, that magic's left. They were childless. They were barren. Said Elizabeth couldn't conceive. And yet Deuteronomy 7 said that if they just obeyed all the commandments, their current circumstances would not happen. You ever 
wondered about this in your own walk with God, say, Lord, I have been so faithful to you. I haven't missed a Sunday. I have not only volunteered to teach Sunday school, I've taken on the new church directory. No, I just had fit Sherry in there. Because I, I had to ask for voluntold peoples, not volunteers, you know. A church directory again. Lord, I work. I never go home. Some of you were here yesterday working hard, trying to make it so that, you know, we could celebrate a life and then know, man, as, uh, well, I might as well throw Nancy under the bus. She doesn't mind extra attention. Nancy says, shall I just go ahead and fall asleep on this pew because I won't be here this morning. You know, all of that's going on. You're working so hard for God, and yet you say, Lord, where is this increase? Where is this promise? That's not half as bad as when your fellow believers say, well, there must be some secret sin. There must be something that they're not doing that God told them to do. Or this bad thing wouldn't happen. Maybe it's not barrenness, but maybe it's you're thinking, God, that is the third tragedy in that family that's happened. You know, and, and, and if you're like me, hopefully you're not like me. But, but you know, I, I, I'm a control freak. And when I see tragedy happen somewhere else, I think, oh, man, am I doing anything that exposes me to that tragedy because I want to avoid it. I, you know, I, I said earlier, I call this Christian witchcraft, and I accuse myself of it all the time to say, have I prayed enough this week? Did I miss my Bible reading? That? What do I need to do so that that tragedy that doesn't land on me? So it's even that kind of stinking thinking is in, even in your pastor's theology, and I have to fight against it. Because I'm sure it looked inexplicable to Zechariah and Elizabeth. They knew the scriptures. They'd grown up. They were preacher's kids. It said so in Luke 1. They were both preacher's kids. And preacher's kids before that. Second and third generation preacher's kids. And here they were. Christmas for two. Okay, it wasn't Christmas yet. But all the Jewish celebrations, feasts, Passover, all, or Tabernacles, Passover, all of those things, dinner for two. You know they had to struggle. You know they had to wonder what they were doing wrong. And if they didn't, those around them wondered, oh, you know, they still don't have any kids. Wonder what they're doing wrong. This happens sometimes in a faith community. I marvel that they persevered. Some of you know, I have friends who've quit coming to church for even less than that, who have gotten angry at God and said, nope, he hasn't delivered. You told me in Sunday school if I did this, this, and this, I'd be blessed. Well, I don't feel blessed right now, so I'm just going to go to Walmart on Sunday. I'm just going to go do this other thing on Sunday. I'm going to do, I'm gonna, my God's going to be the NFL or whatever other thing I can pour myself into that has <laughs> all the structure of a religion without any obligation to a living God. Well, we know how the story went, right? That's the amazing thing, that God looked down and he saw this blameless couple, faithful even when it looked like he hadn't been faithful to them. And he looked down and he said, I'm going to start a whole brand new covenant. I, Deuteronomy 7 said it was a covenant of love, but the real covenant of love starts in this barren couple that if they didn't feel abandoned, their synagogue probably thought they were abandoned. And God said, no, I am going to do this new thing. It's been, I've been silent since Malachi. Since the end of the Old Testament, I haven't spoken to my people. But now I am going to come and Elizabeth, she's going to be a mom. And <laughs> it's going to, it's funny, her husband's a preacher and he doesn't even believe the angel when the angel says, you're going to have a kid. And boom, all of a sudden we have a new covenant. And it's God doing this new thing amongst a people that, amongst a couple 
that everyone pretty was sure was there's some secret sin in their house. That's why they don't have a kid. And then they have a kid. And not just any kid. They have the kid that has the privilege of saying God's new covenant is starting now. So I just want to encourage you, if you think you've been ticking all the boxes and not getting any of the bounty, think about these two. Think about these people that could be faithful even when there was no sign of reward for their fidelity. Because, trust me, God sees it all. And God honors it. And this was the couple that had the privilege of introducing his son, going ahead of his son, to make sure they were ready for this new thing God was doing. Let's be faithful. Let's be ready. Let's live in expectation of a God who does these great things amongst faithful people. Let us pray. Lord, we know your commandments. We know your teachings. Let us be faithful. Let us not just be those who do these things because we want a reward, but because you're worthy. And that because we're faithful, we know you will be faithful. You are a living, loving God, and we worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.